Our next speaker, Peter McCoy, has tightenized our minds through his grassroots organization and book title, Radical Mycology, his mycology school, Michael Logos, and in nearly every documentary or festival that has celebrated fungi since Peter was alive and aware of his deeply curious relationship with the non-plant, non-animal fungal kingdom, or as Peter prefers to say, queendom. In many ways, Peter is the Spitzenkorper, a term I learned from Peter that is a mysterious ball of bubbles that forms and moves at the growing tip of a fungal hypha that leads the mycelium in the most relevant direction for growth. And in this way, Peter is the Spitzenkorper to our mycelium. And if he's our leader, I am a happy hypha to follow him. For Peter is leading us in a world in which fungal cultivation recognition and appreciation are all possible. Um, with more of us in relationship with fungal partners, we can work together to detoxify our soils. As the lead mycologist at MycoCycle, a mycoremediation organization, Peter shows us that we can transform toxins into oxalate crystal laden gold. And with that, it is my honor to introduce to you the part human, part fungi, Peter McCoy. Welcome. My name is Peter McCoy, and I'm the author of Radical Mycology, a treatise on seeing and working with fungi, and the founder of MycoLogos, the world's first mycology school. I've been studying and working with fungi since I was a teenager. An interest that I picked up out of curiosity has thankfully never left my side, because as I've grown older and learned more about the world, the influences of these incredible organisms has come in tow. Nearly every aspect of life throughout human history and the natural world has been heavily influenced by fungi. But this paradigm, unfortunately, is something that most of us never learn about. Luckily, in this talk, we'll be able to scratch the surface on some of the incredible influences and significant impacts that fungi have on soil and soil health. And hopefully through this talk, help shed some light on some of the ways that perhaps we've overlooked those roles in almost any study of those topics of soil health and environmental health, as well as some of the ways that we can start to incorporate our understanding of fungi into our practices, whether as casual observers, as champions of the fungi, or actual practitioners and amateur mycologists working to further our still nascent and, and young understanding of this really incredible field. Mycology is one of the youngest natural sciences and Ultimately, we know very little about fungi and even less about the best ways to work with them and apply them in human systems and in soil regeneration strategies. But thankfully, as our knowledge base has grown and the ability to share that information through conferences such as this has enabled many people to get on the same page about these topics, we're rapidly seeing this once fringe topic and, and understanding of the natural world become more and more central to discussions where it's relevant. In this talk, I'll only be able to scratch the surface on many topics that could easily use a whole workshop unto themselves. Hopefully, though, I pique your interest to dive deeper into any, if not all of these topics in the coming months, if not throughout the rest of your life as you continue to work with soil and ultimately work with fungi no matter where you are in the natural world. With all that said, let's just dive in and start to wrap our heads around what are fungi, what are they doing in soils, and how can we begin to apply them in our lives? So the first question we must ask ourselves is, what are fungi? Well, the vast majority, about 99%, live as a network of tissue known as mycelium. The other 1% live as single cells, typically as yeast, but the vast majority, the ones we're most interested in this talk, especially, are the filamentous or mycelium-forming fungi. Mycelium is a distributed network, it is non-centralized, and it's bifurcating at the tips. And each of those tips in the network really acts as an individual, expanding, growing, and learning about the environment and dynamically responding to it in a number of ways. It's really the mycelium that does all the interesting work we're gonna talk about, and it's really the mycelium that moves the world and shapes and in many ways designs the world around us. And it's really done, if you boil it down, to each of those individual tips. At each hyphal tip, we have what's known as the Spitzenkorper. This is a unique fungal structure or organelle-like structure in the tip that acts like the captain and navigator assessing the environment and responding to it through growth direction and orientation, as well as the release of digestive and protective exudates. 
some fungi concentrate their mycelium into structures that we call fruit bodies, most notably the mushrooms, which though they look quite different, are nothing more than condensed mycelium. Under the microscope, it's the same tissue. Unlike plants and animals where we have different tissues and organs, even the mushroom is all mycelium, if you can believe it. Conversely, the microfungi, the molds, form their mycelium into microscopic structures to produce their fruit bodies or spore-bearing structures. Here is a high, high magnification of um, a mold. Here's what you might see on your food, or in this case, a petri dish, food if it goes bad, that is. And here's under a microscope. Ultimately, each of those threads is mycelium. And at the end of the mycelium, spores are being produced to reproduce the organism. But in the molds, we have the microstructures. In the mushrooms, we have macroscopic and visible structures. So as I mentioned at the tip, there is this unique structure known as the Spitzen Corper. It, again, could be a whole workshop unto itself, but it's something to really appreciate from a biological standpoint. It's one of the things that makes fungi quite unique is this thing that we actually don't know much about. Uh, it's essentially a collection of bubbles of compounds. We don't really know what's in those compounds, nor do we really understand how they're receiving signals from the environment and at the same time releasing compounds dynamically in response to the environment while simultaneously building the tip as the mycelium grows forward. The mycelium does not extend along its sidewalls. It's the tip that's kind of constantly dissolving and rebuilding over and over and over again as it grows forward. How this is done without the mycelium falling apart is something we actually can't quite explain. As fungi encounter things in their environment, they respond in a number of ways, most notably through defense or digestion. Here we see a mold advancing upon a mushroom mycelium, and that mushroom is releasing antifungal compounds that are keeping the mold at bay. In the soil, this is happening in a million different ways in every square centimeter, cubic centimeter of the soil, each hyphal tip responding to a virus or bacteria or other fungal competitor or antagonist and releasing the right compound to defend itself. This is because the mycelium doesn't have a skin. It's only one cell thick, and the only way it defends itself from the environment is through this chemical bath of protection. This makes fungi, in many ways, incredible chemists. This is really a theme of mycology on the whole, and especially of this talk, and really any talk on fungal ecology, is that fungi are just incredible chemists, and they do a lot of chemistry, if you will, and to, to put it simply, that other organisms just never evolved to do, because fungi were already there doing it so well. So what are fungi? Well, they are in their own category in the tree of life, known as the mycetae or fungal kingdom or fungal queendom, as I like to call it. And we estimate anywhere from on the low end, 1.5 million species, upwards of 6 million species, with the more conservative estimate right now being around 2.3 million species. We've named roughly 100,000. That number is probably a good bit higher, but it's a nice easy one to round around. And so it's roughly about one to 3% of all fungi have been named. And that's just naming them. We know very little about those species, ecological roles, especially the ones in the soil. What are they doing? And there's a lot of unknowns there, unfortunately, but we're making advancements every day. Most of us might be familiar with the macroscopic mushrooms, the um, like one you see here, many of which are found in a group or phylum of fungi known as the Basidiomycota. But in the soil and in, in fungal ecology, we also find the ascomycotin fungi being quite significant. There are some mushrooms here, such as the morel mushroom, but many of our important molds are here, as well as different yeast species, including yeast that are found in the soil. We also have another phylum of the glomeromycota or arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi or AM fungi. Uh, AMF is another acronym. I'll keep saying that. So this is a point to maybe take a note about these species because um, they'll come back. And these are our three most important fungal phylum in this talk. There are several others, but uh, they're more of academic studies as opposed to really appreciating fungal ecology and soil. Some fungal biology that's just important to understand, they don't have chlorophyll, they don't photosynthesize, and they also don't have a stomach. The way that they get their nutrition primarily is through external digestion. And this is one of the ways that we can think about separating them from the other eukaryotic and macroscopic organisms. Fungi have to digest externally. They released the digestive compounds I mentioned along with the defense compounds, compounds and break down food in their environment and absorb the byproducts. A lot of the byproducts are left aside and wash away and are food for other organisms. 
with fungi getting the peptides, amino acids, um, and simple carbohydrates, etc. Uh, some of the unique fungal features is in their cell wall, they have a compound known as ergosterol. This is somewhat uh, similar to our melanin in that it can convert uh, ultraviolet light into vitamin D, um, but it's unique to fungi. Their cell walls are made about 10 to 20% of chitin, which is the same material, of course, in insect exoskeletons. So their cell wall is quite different than that of plants. And they store their energy in some special sugars and alcohols. One notable is trehalose. So the influence of fungi on soils probably goes back to nearly the beginning of life. And why I say that because some of our oldest fungal fossils date from nearly 2.4 billion years ago. And there's even evidence that they might have been in the soil or early uh, crust of Earth 3.5 billion years ago. So pretty close to the beginning of Earth. Um, but the theory goes that the bacteria that arose first on Earth piled up and over time something evolved to eat them. And that thing was a fungus or a fungal-like organism. Something larger that could consume and digest the detritus of, of life. Over time, these early fungi teamed up with early plant cells and formed early lichens, our oldest fossils being roughly 600 million years old from the shores of China. The notion is that these early lichens crept onto land and through the acids produced by the fungal partner in the lichens, lichens, at least modern lichens are about 95% fungal tissue, through their acids dissolved the rock of early earth and enabled the plants to get minerals and over time creep further inland until the early earth was covered in lichens and essentially and eventually rather uh, turning into early soils as those lichens decomposed and the bacteria and probably other fungi that were evolving ate the lichens and so really essentially fungi if you will created the first soils of earth there might have been bacteria first but Really, it's the fungi in many respects that created true soils as we might think of them today. This is somewhat backed up by a study from a few years ago that in short showed that as fungi and bacteria travel into arid wastelands, basically dry zones, the fungi go in first and through their network of mycelium, draw water from behind themselves and into the dry area, which the bacteria then follow. So the early earth might have looked like the Namib desert in Namibia, which is covered in these orange lichens that get moisture from the sea and are able to survive in other, and are the primary vegetation in this uh, park. So eventually time goes on and plants evolve out of the early lichens is at least my uh, conjecture. They branched upward, started producing by spores, and lo and behold, inside of themselves had fungi, internal fungi that we call endophytic fungi. All plants now have these fungi living inside of them. The number of species that form endophytic relationships is unknown. It's one of the reasons our estimates are so broad and, and uncertain is because we don't know how many internal or endophytic fungi live inside of plants all around the world. But our oldest plant fossil has these fungi. So it really speaks to the importance of fungi partnerships and fungal partnerships throughout the natural world and especially in plant health and as we'll touch on briefly probably in animal and human health as well internally that is uh, eventually plants start developing roots and in the oldest fossil of a plant with roots we find mycorrhizal fungi fungi that live in association with plant roots those fungi likely performing similar functions to the mycorrhizal fungi of today meaning defense against predators and and uh combative uh, fungi and other organisms living in the soil, as well as nutrient acquisition. Essentially, these fungi evolved to feed the nutrients from the soil that the fungi had created to the plants that were starting to penetrate into those soils and needed to get those nutrients, but didn't have the chemical mastery to manipulate those uh, nutrients and get them in the way that they needed them in a water soluble form, nor did they have the thin mycelial networks that could travel relatively quickly and cover so much surface area due to their small diameter and thus access more nutrients and bring to bring back to their plant partner. And we'll get more into this in just a minute. If we flash forward from this point in history to today, we now find that fungi are infused throughout all layers of soil. Of course, as great decomposers, they're breaking down the organics and the organics layers up top, but also through the acids they release, they are also helping solubilize minerals in some of the lower layers, somewhat similar to what they were doing in the early earth as lichens. 
They play many important roles in nutrient cycles. Um, some of the most important we might think about are the phosphorus, carbon, and nitrogen cycles. In the phosphorus cycle, we have a lot of phosphorus, of course, wrapped up in organic forms, in uh, organic material, plant animal tissue, and fungi as uh, decomposers in this way can break down those organic sources as they break down uh, the manure and tissue of living organisms. There's also the inorganic forms, basically the, the mineral forms bound up in soils and clays and things, and through the acids they produce, uh, especially certain fungi are well suited and are quite notable for their releasing of and rather solubilizing or making available phosphorus for plants and plant partners and other organisms likely as well in the soil, but especially for plants. This has a huge implication uh, in many respects if this is a kind of new topic to you because phosphorus fertilizers especially are most commonly applied especially in you know big ag as an as a synthetic version of what fungi naturally do and some bacteria some bacteria also solubilize through their own exudates um, phosphorus in the soil but speaking of fungi what they're doing is essentially growing on rock or near rock releasing compounds phosphorus comes off becomes a water soluble form they channel that to their plant partner this kind of a simplified version when we extract phosphorus from the earth as humans that is to make a synthetic or artificial fertilizer we extract rock put it through a pretty nasty multi-step industrial process using strong industrial acids to break down that rock create a water soluble form of fertilizer pour it on the plant or out into the fields but so much of that following up on all the environmental waste and destruction that it took to get there much of that fertilizer is ultimately either bound up in the soil and becomes unusable or might very well wash away to river deltas or not to the ocean so this is a big big topic really and the notion of peak phosphorus is tossed around something like other peak resources where we might be facing and we we kind of <laughs> we certainly are uh, and one way to potentially help mitigate and slow the effects of running out of phosphorus or big reserves of it is better utilizing natural organisms who are able to uh, more accurately dose out the amount of phosphorus as needed so there are protocols that are out there for incorporating phosphorus solubilizing bacteria and fungi mycorrhizal fungi along with phosphate rock into your soil systems and try to mirror and mimic what nat nature naturally does. Conversely, some of the roles that fungi have on the carbon cycle are quite opposite to the extraction and resource utilization of phosphorus solubilizing fungi. Rather, the fungi that take in carbon, which is pretty much all of them, uh, especially the mycorrhizal ones, help sink it into the soil. And also the decomposers do this, but it's most notable with the root associating or mycorrhizal species, because in as much as trees and plants, of course, uh, photosynthesize and take in carbon dioxide out of the air, turn it into sugars, bring it into their body and into their tissue and down to their roots to sink it. It's really the fungi and the mycorrhizal fungi that take that sugar, transform it from sucrose into their own trehalose and move it into their tissue. And as they grow, they deposit it or help sink and store it in the soil, both as their tissue and as the exudates they release, which then go on to feed microbial webs, the whole soil food web. It might very well be that this action of mycorrhizal fungi and their tissue and their exudates being one of the biggest carbon reserves and sources for soil microbial communities. But this notion is pretty much often missing from, from assessments and it's sort of a whole uh, picture, maybe not so much in this conference, hopefully, but generally speaking. And so in as much as we might think about uh, bringing more, planting more trees, trying to help with bringing carbon dioxide out of the air, you know, my mind, it's always way to think about the fungi. And sometimes we got to think about the fungi first, and that's a little bit of my bias, but this is actually is what's happening. And as we'll touch on later, of course, that goes on to feed many other organisms, both microorganisms and as I'm showing here and with this small mammal, uh, larger ones. Fungi are also critical in the cycling of minerals, again, through the releasing of acids that help break down and release not just the phosphorus and certain types of phosphate rock, but really probably helping dissolve many types of rock or solubilize or slowly degrade them, however you want to phrase it. Notably, oxalic acid is one common one, but there are other acids fungi release, such as citric acid, 
and several others that are doing this work to influence soil pH, mineral and nutrient availability in soils, but also again, help weather rocks, chemically weather rocks. These are just a couple mold species that have been found to do this. And it's likely that many species do this, many microfungi, soil dwelling molds, fungi that are just poorly understood, probably many that have yet to be named are doing this as part of their, their ecological role to feed themselves, but also at the same time feeding everything else. On the flip side, we have fungi that help create minerals in the soil, perhaps most notably uh, weedolite, which is one of the most common sources of calcium in the, in the soil, calcium being a really major uh, important structural element in plant cell walls. And this is a hyphal thread covered in weedolite crystals. And the hypothesis is that through some of the actions um, of fungal growth, that the creation of these crystals is a natural byproduct and they get shed and released into the environment and serve as a calcium sink and basically a reserve to be tapped into later, probably by other fungi or other microbes that break that down or break those bonds, create water soluble forms of calcium to then feed to plants. We also find interesting roles where fungi are uh, potentially farming other organisms. This is actually a pretty compelling paper that came out a few years ago, or rather an image from that paper, uh, basically as the title shows, that they were able to prove in the lab that this morel species essentially farms bacteria for its own benefit. And this is a was pretty groundbreaking at the time, and it really has sort of big unknowns that come along with it about how fungi are really not only coaxing and, and designing uh, the, the flora of the world, as we'll touch on with the mycorrhizal fungi, but potentially how they're sculpting the other organisms in the soil, the microorganisms, and how they are manipulating or uh, designing or just self-servingly <laughs> manipulating um, the, the soil food web or just at least the organisms around themselves. Big, big questions, pretty interesting um, paper if you get a chance to read it. In the soil, we do find, as I said, many types of fungi, um, but again, only a few have been really looked at and appreciated and especially applied in human systems. Trichoderma is a genus that has a pretty good history and a good bit of uh, research into it, pretty easy to learn about, and it's a fairly common inoculant that you'll find in many different sort of fungi-focused soil amendment products. And this is a mold that is one of the most common soil mold genera around the world. And that's why it's fairly universally accepted and not necessarily a, a concern for uh, invasiveness or things like this or, or really shifting the soil web because it's probably already there no matter where you sample your soil. Uh, this is a nice uh, false color image of this mold that is actually these molds that are typically quite uh, less appealing, green, greenish blue color. And despite their appearance, though, they are well respected for their ability to greatly and rapidly break down cellulosic material. And because of that, they're commonly added to and can be added to compost piles to significantly inc increase the rate at which the compost breaks down. Sometimes they're referred to as just a fungal compost activator. A lot of products are called that that have trichoderma, but these molds are very easy to grow. It's a mold. It's one of the more common ones. It's one of the more common ones you might find on spoiled food and things. And there are really simple recipes for if you want a, a native one, you could just take your local soil, sprinkle it onto, you know, moistened wheat bran, and you'll probably get some trichoderma growing, probably some other molds as well. But there are, there are more specific ways to really isolate just the trichoderma if you want to get specific. But, I mean, you're ultimately growing molds. And um, the trichoderma is one is, that were, is well respected for its functions there. Um, alongside that breakdown or decomposition ability, they're also well respected as plant defenders at the same time. They're actually uh, fungal antagonists. They're, they're mycotrophic, meaning they attack other fungi. They will actually wrap their mycelium around the mycelium of other fungi and burrow into the, the hypha of the other fungus and travel into its hypha and suck out its uh, cytoplasm. So they're they're pretty aggressive in a lot of ways. They're actually one of the more common problems in a mushroom farm is trichoderma is attacking your mushroom. And because of that, they're great defenders of, of root rot and other um, you know fungal pathogens, especially that attack plants, but also slime molds and things that aren't true fungi. So there's a lot of research for trichoderma on both these aspects, things to look into for uh, plant health, especially in areas that are tilled where mycorrhizal relationships can't be established. They might be a good amendment um, or additive. And then also, again, to compost activation. And this is just a photograph of trichoderma, just seeing how their spores uh, branch or their, their hyphae branches, their spores develop. 
somewhat similar, but probably quite different, um, is a broad uh, group of fungi that are typically just referred to as indigenous microorganisms. And this is, as the name implies, not just fungi, but other organisms. But if you're new to this concept, you've never heard of this before, what this is based on is a protocol that comes out of Korean natural farming, where in short, rice, partially cooked rice is left out undisturbed for some amount of time in a natural setting. Mold and other organisms grow on it. And then later you harvest that moldy grain, bring it back home, dilute it, do a couple steps to essentially propagate out and expand and multiply all those organisms. And then you mix that into your garden or farm soil. The idea being that you're bringing in greater diversity of microorganisms to your soil that might very well be depleted in those natural organisms due to tilling and chemicals and whatnot. This of course is a whole workshop unto itself about how to make IMO, but there's uh, quite a lot to easily learn about it on the internet. Um, so I'll kind of leave it up to you to dive in deeper, but just something to note, something I always see when I see people making it, working with it is that it's, it's moldy, <laughs> it's moldy stuff. You're growing a lot of fungi. There's a lot of other organisms too, but you always gotta give a shout out to the fungi. So something you appreciate there, very low cost, low tech, um, but with a lot of great anecdotal um, effects and benefits coming from it. Uh, this is just one of the more common soil molds that you might be incorporating or might be getting in your IMO. It's hard to say. Most people aren't sequencing and separating all the organisms there. This is just a really beautiful species uh, or genus rather, Mortiriella. Um, you can actually bait these fungi out of soil by taking soil samples and sprinkling a little bit of moistened crab meal. And because they prefer to eat chitin, and that's one of their roles is chitin decomposers in the soil, they'll climb out of the soil and really propagate and form this really nice rosette forming mycelium on your soil sample. So it's a nice uh, experiment, something to do with the kids perhaps. And then we come to the heavy hitters of the soil fungi game, and that is the mycorrhizal species. And if you're new to this concept, uh, brace yourself because it's a big one. So on the uh, one side, we have a root tip that has no fungal partner. And on the other side, we have a whole lot of fungi growing off that root. And what's the difference here? Well, there's a lot going on. One, you have protection provided by that mycelium. It's literally a barrier to other antagonists. You also have essentially uh, exponentially increased surface area through which that root is able to acquire water and nutrients. As we'll look at in the next few slides, these mycorrhizal fungi form an intimate relationship with the root. They penetrate into the root and they become sort of one with the root, although they are distinct organisms. And through that uh, barter system, they're exchanging nutrients both ways. And this is uh, found throughout probably all plants in one form or another, as we'll touch on. Even the non-mycorrhizal plants actually have root associating fungi living with them. So there's some sort of root association with most plants, if not all plants in the wild, even if it's not a true mycorrhiza. But the benefits seem to be more or less the same across the board. We can summarize it as helping with defense, um, boosting, bolstering the immune response of the plant in, in numerous ways, and also just increasing nutrient ac and water acquisition um, in different ways. Some fungi and categories better at certain nutrients than others, but for simplicity's sake, that's what they're primarily doing. The best studied, not only mycorrhizal relationship, but really plant fungal symbiosis of any type is the arbuscular mycorrhizal relationship, the AM fungi, the AMF, however you want to call them. They're in the phylum, the glomeromycota. These are essentially all synonyms for the same group of roughly 300 species or so. They are the ones that are found on the oldest plant fossil with roots. And today they still look quite similar to that early form, meaning they haven't evolved very much in roughly 500 million years, meaning that their form and function is very successful. And now they're found on roughly 90, 95% of all plants in the world. So the benefits they provide seems to be quite beneficial for the plants. Many plants heavily depend on, if not their AM fungi, their other mycorrhizal partners for these benefits. They've co-evolved since the beginning of rooted plants and really most many wild plants uh, benefit from them significantly and many cannot survive without these partners. Uh, their structure in the root is, is kind of like an arbuscule uh, or it's called an arbuscule. It's kind of like an arbus or a tree. Um, because it's highly branching. So all that surface area, and this is inside of a root cell, is enabling nutrient exchange two ways. 
These are one of my favorite groups of fungi because they're actually quite weird and anomalous in a number of ways. Uh, they're some of the most unusual fungi, and arguably they're so unusual that some have argued they should be separated from fungi on the tree of life. They should actually represent their own unique branch separate from everything else because they're so unusual in a number of ways. One of the most intriguing is that in their very, very large spores, as you see here, they can have anywhere from uh, 500 to 3,500 genetically distinct nuclei. Compare that to pretty much all other eukaryotic organisms on the planet, which typically only have one and maybe two set of genetics. That's pretty unusual. How and why these fungi have acquired their genetic database and why they hold on to it is quite unknown. It actually opens a lot of questions about what are they doing in the soil and how is all that genetics being moved and shared and shifted? Uh, what does it all mean? It's actually a pretty big question for me that comes along with these guys. And for that reason alone, I think they're quite worthy of just appreciating and kind of wowing out about. But practically speaking, there's actually ways we can incorporate them into our systems. We can cultivate them and really uh, apply them because they significantly benefit most commercial crops and even just um, environmental restoration efforts. They're, again, the most studied plant symbiosis, hands down, fungal or otherwise, because of their incredible influence on plant health and especially crop yield. They do a number of things along with defense and nutrient acquisition. Uh, another being that they also produce a unique sticky compound called glomalin. It's essentially like a super sticky super glue protein for the soil that takes the little micro aggregates created by bacterial glues and makes them into macro aggregates, bigger pores and crumbs, and really helps provide the true crumb structure of healthy uh, undisturbed soils where these fungi are present. It's a compound only produced by them. And though it can be extracted and you can actually separate glomalin from soils if you want to, it can't necessarily be incorporated in. It sort of has to be uh, blended in via the fungi growing through. Some argue or, or some studies have suggested that roughly a third of soil carbon is actually made out of glomalin. That's actually been debated. So perhaps the jury's a little bit out on that one as far as I've come to understand it. But likely it's a pretty significant contributor to soil carbon, and especially long-term soil carbon storage, because there's an iron component to glomalin that makes it very stable and doesn't degrade very easily. They think its lifespan is roughly around 45 years in the soil, so it's a very stable compound, and during that time is helping, again, provide that structure and eventually decaying and providing a carbon and a little bit of iron reserve. Um, it also helps things like um, bind up heavy metals, a little bit of bioremediation quality, but um, it's not really something we can directly apply and utilize as a clear set protocol type of function, but it's something that's happening in the soil is interactions with heavy metals. And also just through its ability to help build soil structure, of course, it's doing all the other good things we like with soil structure, helping hold more water, reduce desertification, um, et cetera. As I mentioned, you can cultivate these fungi. This is a photo coming from the Rodale Institute uh, showing their protocol for cultivating these fungi on simple grasses in plastic bags, plastic pots, so that you can have a large quantity of it for next to nothing cost-wise to utilize in your garden or farm. This protocol is free. You can look it up online through the Rodale Institute, and um, it's pretty straightforward, so I'll kind of leave it at that. Essentially, you get some native soil or a commercial product, inoculate grass, grow it through a season, chop it off or just let it die naturally, and then harvest the soil full of spores, uh, mycorrhizal spores, and then apply that next season. You can also do lots of other things working with these fungi. You can uh, sieve your soil and harvest their spores and identify them and get a quantification and qualification of the diversity and abundance of these fungi as a metric for soil health. Uh, these are photos here coming from the International Vesicular Arbuscular Mycorrhizal Culture Collection in VAM at the University of West Virginia. And they have lots of protocols on their website for how to do these more advanced techniques. You can also take your plant crops and harvest the roots and stain them and look for the arbuscules under a microscope as another visual reference for how mycorrhizae your plants are, are currently or have become after you introduce a commercial or self-made inoculum. So there are 
these are again, of course, more advanced techniques, but there are ways to not just blindly throw a mycorrhizal product at your crop and hope it works, but actually to see if things are changing. Uh, of course, with you can visually see the plant's health, but even beyond that, you can sample the roots, look for the mycorrhizae, or count the number of spores and their diversity you know, before and after or at the beginning and end of a season. These, I think, are more accurate methods to, to track what's going on um, and not just be confused that maybe some other variable in your fertilizing strategy is actually what influenced the plants. One thing to note about these fungi is that because they are dependent on the plant accepting them in, to form the relationship, if the plant is heavily fertilized, it doesn't need the fungus. So the fungus, even if you apply it as a commercial product, it's just going to die if you're also applying lots of compost and lots of fertilizers, etc. So this is part of the, the challenge with working with these in, the, in your crop system is not over fertilizing and thus essentially eliminating the need for these fungi to do all the benefits that they provide. So this again is detailed a bit more in the Rodale protocol, but just something to be aware of, especially if you're currently doing that buying a commercial or buscular mycorrhizal product because it you've heard that it's a good thing but then also heavily fertilizing you know kind of uh, shooting yourself in the foot in this way the next major category of mycorrhizal fungi are the ectomycorrhizae these fungi don't so much penetrate into the root cells in as much as they go into the root structure and wrap around the root tip as they do that they tend to make the root tips look nubby and white or other colored and here we see in cross-section have this thick sheath, as we call it, of mycelium. As we see in the center photo, there is no root tissue touching the soil system that this was, you know, prior to the photo taken, uh, ripped out of. Rather, the root is covered with this thick, thick layer of mycelium. And that is what's interacting with the soil system doing so much of this work. These fungi comprise about 5% of mycorrhizal relationships, or rather there's about 5% of plants in the world that form this relationship. Most are trees or shrubs. And a lot of these fungi are the mushrooms and truffles that we can only find in a forest or tree setting, uh, woodland setting. These are the fungi that we can't easily cultivate because they need this plant relationship. Not only has the plant evolved to depend on these fungi for survival, so too have these fungi evolved to depend on the plant for their survival. And beyond that, it's very likely that the whole soil web has sort of co-evolved. We can cultivate these fungi in the lab. We can inoculate a tree in a nursery with these fungi, but we very often can't get them to fruit when we want them to, especially in a pot or in a otherwise artificial setting, probably because we are missing one, if not many components of the soil food web that both, or at least the fungal component have evolved to depend on as a part of their life cycle. We have determined in some cases with some mushroom species, ectomycorrhizal species, certain what are called helper bacteria, bacterial species that are needed to be present to initiate fruiting. And so that area of research, um, essentially mycorrhizal helper bacteria, as they're called, uh, is a burgeoning one, one that obviously has great importance if we want to grow chanterelles or bolites or other commercially important wild mushrooms. Uh, consistently in an artificial setting but right now we haven't dialed in so much the appropriate uh, microbial blend or you know compost tea if you will that's going to be the perfect one to get these fungi to grow so instead the species that are commonly cultivated that are ectomycorrhizal are the ones that are fairly tolerant of a lot of different soil and habitat conditions specifically pisolithus is a genus of uh, kind of strange looking mushrooms not so attractive they are edible but most people avoid them uh, species that are tolerant of a wide range of phs soil phs and even soil temperatures they're uh, quite robust quite resilient and easy to cultivate easy to inoculate onto trees and typically establish and they're quite common around the world so kind of a win-win-win um, even though their fruit body or mushroom isn't so attractive their mycelium again can be grown uh, one common inoculum strategy is to get their mycelium to form into little beads um, this is done using essentially a kitchen ingredients used to thicken milkshakes and it makes little jelly beans if you will that can be uh, put into the root zone of trees when they're planted out as one strategy you can also inoculate seedlings right on the petri dish which is happening here and once they establish uh, transplant them up and you can even track and trace and watch how the mycorrhizal relationship establishes. 
We also have a more attractive or more familiar, I guess I should say, mushroom, uh, the Lacaria genera. And these species are edible. They're even slightly medicinal. Um, and they can be pretty easily and consistently cultivated onto a wide variety of tree stock. So they're, these are two genera to be really well aware of. And if you're already buying ectomycorrhizal inoculum for your trees or what whatnot, just look at the species list and you're probably going to find these two on there, as well as probably some uh, puffball genera, such as Rhizopogon as one example. In dryland parts of the world, especially the Middle East and Mediterranean area, uh, desert truffles are an ectomycorrhizal category of fungi that are traditional food and medicine source for people in that part of the world. These fungi kind of look like potatoes and they're pretty rich in protein and also um, some other nutrients and, and again some health benefits but what's interesting here is that they've been in recent years um, found to be able to be cultivated on rock rose shrubs this has certainly implications for that part of the world and as i might hope um, other parts of the world that maybe are currently hot or dry or getting more and more so that way so this is certainly something to look into as just another crop strategy rather another um you know, fungal function or fungal layer to add to a food uh, production system in maybe a drier or hotter part of the world. We have another category of mycorrhizae known as ericoid species. These are uh, less appreciated as far as um, applications in human systems, but they are quite important ecologically. They're typically restricted to tundras, um, taiga, boreal forests, heathlands, like I'm showing here. Typically areas that are very um, harsh, very acidic soils, and yet these fungi are able to thrive there. Sometimes the soil can be as low as uh, has been recorded 2.5 pH, essentially lemon juice. And yet these fungi are able to manipulate the soil pH to move nutrients and release and solubilize nutrients, not only for themselves, but for the plants that they form a mycorrhizal relationship with. Pretty incredible chemistry. So here we have some heather. Here we have some images of their mycelium and structures, and here's another image in the uh, root stain. In one of my favorite papers on these fungi, they're described as, in many ways, the true keystone species of these whole habitats. They are designing and, and shaping it or really enabling it to, to continue on because not only do they act as mycorrhizal uh, pH manipulators and whatnot, but also as the primary fungal decomposers. As their plant partner dies and their branches fall, they're the same species that are decomposing that material and feeding it back into the next door neighbor. And you expand that and take that to this whole uh, vista. And really it's these fungi that are sculpting this, this habitat without them, you know, the, all this plant life more or less couldn't survive. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, good examples of applying them consistently yet. Um, certainly back blueberries and other relatives in the air casey, uh, and especially productive crops could be, uh, benefited by ericoid mycorrhizal inoculum, but those products are relatively few and their success stories are less noted than with the other species or other types of mycorrhizal fungi. We have a couple other types of mycorrhizal fungi, the monotropoid associate with the monotropa plants that don't photosynthesize. The mushrooms and fungi here essentially act as intermediaries, taking carbon and other nutrients from say a nearby tree moving it through themselves and onto these plants. These plants are often considered parasites of the mushroom, although I would like to think that there's some reason the fungi essentially allow this to happen. You would think, I would think at least, that over all the years, uh, the fungi are pretty smart. They wouldn't necessarily let themselves be taken advantage of. Um, so there has to be some other function, you know, keeping these, these plants alive for good reason. But we haven't sussed out the, the exact reason just yet. We also have the orchidaceous mycorrhizae that associate with all 22 to 25,000 orchid species in the world. Orchid seeds have no nutrient coat, and when they start out, they need fungi in the wild at least to obtain nutrition. And maybe eventually they break that relationship, that mycorrhizal relationship, but many species keep it for most, if not all, of their life. The mycelium here forms these dense balls inside of the root cell, as you see in this photograph called pelotons and they go out and do all this great chemistry and whatnot to harvest the food for the orchids now orchids being the most evolved or highly evolved angiosperms i have to wonder you know is it a more beneficial thing through evolution to be so heavily dependent on something else for your survival 
I guess, taking advantage of something that is abundant in the environment. Maybe that makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. Or is it another way to think about it, more evolutionary successful to be in good relationship with something that is so successful and so resilient, these fungi that do so much already and you know they're helping everybody else out already so why not form just just throw it to the wind and say well i'm going to need them anyway might as well just be completely dependent on them from the get-go and accept it as it is that's how i like to frame it most books might frame it the other way currently there are no great applications for working with these fungi per se though of course there are ground dwelling soil dwelling orchids that are dependent on these fungi for some stage of their life so if we are considering rehabilitating, preserving, uh, restoring all kinds of habitats that have these orchids and these plants in them, we're going to need to be aware of these fungi and potentially in some form bring them in if the soil has been so disturbed that they are no longer present. And this diagram is a representation of how the major categories of mycorrhizal fungi are loosely grouped or, or generally grouped rather by biome around the world. So without going through all of them, in the far, far north, we have predominantly pure aracoid mycorrhizal relationships in the black area it transitions to more aracoid and ectomycorrhizal so there's trees and shrubs but also um, you know heathlands and things like this as we get lower we might reach uh, depending on what part of the world temperate forest where there's a mix of arbuscular and ectomycorrhizal species if we get into more grasslands savannas deserts we're going to have predominantly arbuscular mycorrhizal species and so this is uh, just another way to think about where these fungi form, uh, the plants they tend to associate with, and especially the pr predominant plant species in an area um, might be determined by the fungi there or vice versa. The fungi are determined by the plants that are able to survive in that habitat. One last group I'll throw out there to be holistic are the dark septate endophytes named because their septa or cross walls inside their hyphae are pigmented. Though they do not form a true mycorrhizal structure and they are and thus not considered mycorrhizal, they perform somewhat similar of a function. They live inside of the root, they go outside of the root, they acquire nutrients, they draw that in, provide that to themselves and to their partner in some degree. But because there is not a defined uh, formation timing and uh, some other details that come along with what defines a true mycorrhizae, they are separated out from that. But we do find them in plants such as those in the Brassicaceae that are often called non-mycorrhizal because they don't form, you know, say an arbuscular mycorrhizal relationship. But we do find these there. So as I said a few minutes ago, I would conjecture that all plants in the wild likely have some sort of beneficial root association going on with fungi living inside of their root and going out into the environment. Whether that's a traditional mycorrhizal species, trichoderma molds also do something like this, or a dark septate endophyte uh, would depend on the circumstance. So, of course, when we strip away all these fungi through negative impacts on the soil, the plant roots that have evolved to have their fungal partner defend them uh, become susceptible to attack. Maybe it goes a little bit without saying, especially for folks at this conference, but just really trying to hit that point home. We, maybe not so much we here at this conference, but when other people, other humans see this kind of problem going on, root rot, oh, let me just pour more chemicals. Let me do other things that are going to degrade the soil biology, ward off more fungi, maybe even apply some um, antifungal compounds when really maybe the plant is just screaming that they need their fungal partner. The next major category of influential soil fungi are those that degrade wood. Of course, fungi break down all kinds of organic material, plant tissue, um, non-woody plant tissue that is, animal tissues in various ways, manure, dung, etc. But the breakdown of wood is quite significant and quite unique to fungi. In the lab, we have found that some bacteria can break down lignin, the structural component that makes hard uh, wood hard and rigid. But as far as in the wild goes, I personally believe that it's fungi that kickstart the breakdown of wood um, everywhere. I might be wrong, but as far as we can more or less tell, that seems to be the case in most cases. So the breakdown of wood is a pretty big deal. Of course, it's where a lot of nutrients are stored, a lot of carbon is stored, a lot of other stuff, and fungi are a big contributor to breaking that down. And not only through that release of nutrients are they contributing to the soil, but also in many ways to the structure of soil itself. This is something that's often overlooked in environmental assessments and thinking about soil structure and soil building especially in a more natural setting. 
And so it's really important to highlight and just pay attention to and, and look at it and appreciate, I think, on the next time perhaps you go on a walk. At least that's how I like to look at decaying wood is actually through a lens of appreciation. There's two major ways that this is done. Uh, there's brown rot and white rot based on the, the product produced. It's two different pathways of oxidizing lignin. Essentially, it's a cold fire or enzymatic combustion, as it's called, that slowly decays the lignin uh, molecules. Uh, free radicals are created that rip electrons out of the really strong bonds in the, the all the phenolic rings inside of lignin and essentially breaks down this otherwise very, very strong and stable uh, compound. Arguably nature's most complex uh, molecule or molecule category are lignans. There's not just one type of lignin, there's many, perhaps you know, innumerable, which is why no enzyme has been evolved to just attack lignin. Uh, beyond that, lignin is sort of water repellent slash enzyme repellent. So fungi developed this backdoor strategy of creating free radicals to disassemble uh, through the, the theft of electrons, if you will, lignin as an oxidation process. So there's two different ways it's done uh, without going into the details. One produces a brown crumbly structure, or often cubical structure that is, and the other more white stringy cellulosic material. The brown rot is quite important because it's uh, next time you touch it in the forest, you'll see, or in the woods, wherever you find it, that's actually quite spongy in many ways, kind of crumbly, but also spongy. And it acts much like a sponge in the soil. It holds water and nutrients, provides refuge for root tips and mycorrhizal tips. So it's a really beneficial component. And not only that, it's a long-term uh, nutrient storage in its own way. But if we remove wood from the forest, say to burn it, you know, in a large quantity, we're removing this really important contributor. And perhaps I don't have to tell most of the audience members here that. On the other side, we have the white rot, and this is uh, where more lignin is broken down and more cellulose is left behind, hence the difference in appearance. What's interesting about white rot, and you can say this about brown rot too, but there's been arguments more strongly made for white rot, that as lignin here depicted in a couple different um, molecular structures is broken down into its constituent parts and other byproducts, these are the three main structural units of lignin, that there are some of the humic substances created. And so though it's not quite clear how humic substances are created, it's been argued that maybe many of them come from the decay of wood. Makes sense uh, to me, but something to be debated, I guess, a bit further. One last category of macrofungi to give a shout out to are the lichens. Lichens are about 95% fungal tissue and a little bit of photosymbiotic partner, whether algae or cyanobacteria, and perhaps hundreds of other organisms all living inside of this micro ecosystem. Uh, they come in many different forms and in a temperate forest, especially where they're able to get large and leafy like this, they absorb a lot of nutrients out of the air. They're like sponges. They're very sensitive to air quality, which is why you don't find a large lichen diversity in cities. But thankfully, they absorb minerals and other things in the air. And when they fall and decay, they provide those trace elements to the soil floor. Some fungi, uh, some lichens rather, are quite important nitrogen fixers. Uh, along with the nitrogen fixing organisms in the soils, lichens are also important nitrogen fixers, at least those with the appropriate bacterial um, constituents. They fix a lot of nitrogen out of the air. When they fall, they feed that to the soil. And some have argued up to 50% of the nitrogen input in a temperate forest comes from lichens. Not only that, they also help kickstart um, the regeneration of a healthy ecosystem, such as we find on the early earth. And often when you go to a lava flow or landslide, some of the first organisms, macroscopic organisms to live and survive um, are the lichens, the, the rock dwelling lichens that are just as uh, 600 million years ago, living on that rock, solubilizing the minerals, providing refuge for seeds and mosses, eventually in insects that makes way for the uh, multi-layered forest later on. When we turn the mirror around and we look at ourselves, we find fungi living not only on our surface, but also inside of us, somewhat like the mycorrhizal fungi of the forest floor that help modify nutrients and provide defense to their plant partner. Our intestines are much like inside out roots as others have said and written. And there we find fungi in, throughout our body, but also in our guts that 
somewhat act similar to mycorrhizal fungi in that they help with nutrient acquisition and are probably helping with defense in ways we've really yet to understand. Though it's a still burgeoning field, this notion of the mycobiome of our body uh, alongside the microbiome of bacteria, the fungal community in and on our body seems to be heavily influential on our health, digestion, mental health, and probably other facets of the human whole that we've yet to even understand. There's pretty compelling evidence that these fungi influence, for example, the acceptance or rejection of transplanted organs um, and otherwise just overall influence immune response. It makes sense to me if we follow a pattern of nature where they're doing these types of things with, with plants and, and soil, the whole soil system, uh, if you lump it all together, but especially with plants, really just defending their partner, providing nutrients, um, enabling that thing to survive. You know, one could say it's so that the fungus can survive and it's self-serving and selfish in that way. Or you could look at it a different way and say that it's everything's evolved together to all live together and work together, right? And to be a whole uh, holistic organism, right? This whole shared ecosystem is sort of one thing with many little subunits that are all tied together. <laughs> this is the whole notion of ecology. And in the body ecology, fungi are a similar uh, community member. They're not necessarily better than or less than. If if our cells weren't there, they couldn't survive. And if their cells weren't there, we probably couldn't survive. Now we do lots of things to diminish them uh, or shift their community dynamics and their composition through the foods we eat, uh, whether or not we're eating fermented foods, whether we're not whether or not we're eating wild foods, raw foods, foods that have a diversity of endophytic fungi that act as inoculum for our body, which we now know is one major source. Maybe food that is, um, you know, not washed has some soil fungi on it. All these ways that humans historically inoculated their body with bacteria were also means for inoculating their body with wild fungi. If we don't do that anymore, if we drink and eat things that might harm or otherwise remove these fungi from our body, we're losing these major contributors to our health. It's somewhat similar to the uh, big ag field where we've stripped away all the mycorrhizal fungi and the plants are healthy and they're being attacked by root rot. If we strip away all our beneficial fungal partners, you know, how are we being harmed in effect and then calling it something else? It's certainly a major topic, really something that uh, is compelling, not just to me or, or, people that are interested in fungi, but also health practitioners and not just alternative health practitioners, but even allopathic doctors and researchers in, in that approach to medicine are taking pretty clear note of how overlooked this incredibly influential role uh, fungi have probably played since forever um, in, in human health, but has yet to be hardly discussed. So with all that said and much more that could be said, for me, I see fungi, and especially the soil fungi, as not so much like the neural system of the forest floor, as many people have strongly and, and rightfully so argued, but also the circulatory system. You know, they are sort of like the brains, the intelligence, uh, they're guiding, they're responding and doing so much to move information in various forms, whether as a nutrient signal or a request, if you will, from here to there. But as that function, the acting like the circulatory system, acting like the, the pulse of the forest floor uh, and the lymphatic system, purging out the toxins along the way. You know, they really are at the center of not only a, a forest system, but desert systems. We can harvest desert plants and find the fungi there on their roots, etc. It's a It's a different way of seeing the natural world as I mentioned earlier, seeing fungi first, thinking of them first, maybe it's a bias of mine, but if we boil it all down and we think back to the early earth, it's really they that, um, you know, falling on the heels of the bacteria, but in ways that the bacteria and other single celled organisms couldn't do sculpted the, the world and, and built the systems and through their mycorrhizal functions today, Ecologists, mycologists have argued, rightfully so, that they are essentially selecting which plants do and do not survive, and ultimately which insects and herbivores and omnivores and carnivores survive in that habitat, all boiling back to where are the nutrients moving, who's moving them where, who gets what, and in what form. And a lot of that is heavily influenced by the, the mycorrhizal fungi and the soil fungi um, in all their different roles.
Of course, that's my bias, but um, hopefully something to, to simmer on alongside all the other great information presented in this conference. So from here, with all that information, the question is, how can we start to apply it? Well, there's a number of strategies that we could start to look to. I've already mentioned a few, but some of the other approaches are maybe a little bit more straightforward or potentially familiar if you already have a little bit of a background in, in fungi or mushrooms in some form. And that starts with just general mushroom cultivation. This is a skill set that has gotten easier and easier over the last decade, thanks to the internet and all of its many graces. And though that is a large topic and one that fills many workshops unto itself, we boil it down, hopefully, if this is all new to you, into recognizing that at its core, the cultivation of fungi is based on moving mycelium from one food to another. There's many ways to do this. Uh, most commonly, at the center, sort of a middle step, we grow the mycelium on grains. That's what's going on in this, this jar here. And then those grains are sprinkled as a vector, a way to move mycelium as well as nutrients in the grain onto either sawdust or say wheat straw or an agricultural waste or compost or manure, depending on what the mushroom likes. We can do that as well with uh, invasive plants, as we now know, over 200 different agricultural residues and many different invasive plants. So here showing water hyacinth and kudzu are two pretty big notable invasives that mushrooms have been shown to be able to grow on, edible gourmet mushrooms. So what does this have to do with soil health? Well, not only are we maybe helping clear out some of these invasive plants and helping the, the, the ecology, the environment um, along the way with all that, and putting use to and sort of economically, uh, productively incentivizing the harvesties, harvesting of these invasives. At the end result, after we get the mushrooms, the byproduct of that, the, the myceliated substrate, the spent substrate, as we call it, essentially this material that has now been partially digested and fermented by the mycelium, can become its own soil amendment. And there's many uh, applications for it, whether going directly into a compost pile or acting as a top dressing. Um, it could potentially become food or fodder for animals. And then, of course, their waste becomes manure, which goes into other ways of building soils. So there's uh, one of the great aspects of mushroom cultivation is this ability, especially to utilize material that doesn't have any other great purpose. Uh, materials that are really rich in tannic acids that you can't feed as fodder. Maybe that you can't add very much of it to a compost pile, whether uh, for that reason or another. You might very well be able to grow mushrooms on it and get a crop, but at the same time, the fungus breaks down the tannic acids as a great example, say from like coffee bean husks is a, is a really good one for, from, you know, South America, Central America is breaking down that, uh, toxin or that, that compound that animals can't take in, in large quantities, and then turning that material into now a food that the animal can eat after the fungus has fermented it. And we can take that notion to many different agricultural residues, aquacultural residues, etc. get the mushroom as a product, get now a viable fodder and or compost amendment, um, and really help close the cycles, the, maybe the last few cycles in our otherwise fairly holistic human systems and habitat rehabilitation systems that we just didn't quite know how to figure out or how to close well because we weren't cultivating fungi enough or bringing them as much into the picture as we could have or knew how to 10, 20 years ago. Thankfully, nowadays, we do know how to. The skills of growing these fungi is easier and easier. And just all we need at this point, really, is the word to get out you know, more clearly, more quickly, and more people practicing and continuing to innovate and pushing the boundaries into these more experimental areas. There's, of course, ways to bring these fungi into our landscape settings. Uh, among many projects I've done, this is one installation uh, working with some local organizations here in Portland where we created a native mushroom and uh, nut and berry food forest in a local park. Um, this is just a way, so we did have some in-ground wood chip beds inoculated with mushrooms, so the mushrooms fruited, and then over time, that those wood chips get broken down and help contribute to the topsoil. So... As with any, you know, landscaping, land beautification, food forest creation, etc., method, we always, in my mind, should always be thinking about the fungal functions, the fungal layers. That is, so not only are there wood chip beds, there's also inoculated logs, logs inoculated with uh, medicinal and gourmet mushroom species sprinkled throughout this installation. <laughs> 
in dryland environments, there's methods for cultivating what are known as biocrust communities. These are thick crusts that take many years to develop naturally, made out of uh, dozens of organisms living together, essentially building up a, a thick crust on top of the otherwise dry soil that would blow away in these conditions, but yet is stabilized so that it provides refuge for seed and water to be captured and insects to hide out and uh, life to continue, essentially. At the same time, these uh, systems are cultivating and capturing nitrogen and carbon, feeding it to the vegetation in the area, and in many cases, acting as the predominant vegetation um, as this sort of crust community. Again, it's very sensitive. You know, one footprint in these areas can take 100 years to reestablish, but there are methods being developed or at least investigated to cultivate this these communities intentionally. Um, there's a lot of research going on in Utah um, around the national parks areas, especially where they're looking at how to uh, perpetuate these communities that have been pretty heavily impacted through human activity. It's certainly not a well-refined protocol at this point, but something to be aware of and hopefully uh, follow up on and practice if you live in a dry part of the world in the not too distant future. An even more advanced approach to cultivating fungi is applying them in areas that have been impacted by chemical pollution. This is a subset of a large topic, typically just summarized and referred to as microremediation, trying to remedy uh, problems created by humans, simply put. One of the biggest ones we put on to the environment is the spillage, whether intentional or otherwise, of all kinds of chemicals. Many chemicals the earth has arguably, arguably never seen before humans arrived. And yet we know after decades of research by people around the world and labs around the world that many fungi can break down many of these nasty, toxic, and otherwise persistent compounds with relative ease. These are some of the more commonly discussed categories, things you might have heard of, but without getting into the weeds about it, how this all works, if you boil it all down, at least so the theory goes, is that the chemical structure of a lot of these compounds is fairly similar to lignin. In that, though lignin is quite large and complex and has many rings all bound together, strong bonds, etc., it's that similarity in the ringed structures, these benzene rings and phenolic uh, subunits, and the similar types of bonds they all share, for those of you without a strong chemistry background, that the fungi that break down lignin in the wild can use the same mechanism they use to break down lignin on these toxic pollutants. Kind of makes sense, and certainly a couple of decades ago, somebody put two and two together and found out, lo and behold, that that hypothesis held up. And we now know that many fungi have this ability. And not only the wood decomposers, as most of the research has gone into this area looking at, but also ectomycorrhizal fungi, trichoderma molds, even to some degree arbuscular mycorrhizae, have been found to break down different types of chemicals, some species better than others, temperature, pH, a lot of other variables have an effect on how, or an influence on how effective it all is. But this is obviously something quite important, quite worthy of looking at. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of good economic incentive for a number of reasons for this to have been really developed in the ways that we might all hope it would be at this point. It's only been a couple decades, which sounds like a long time, but considering how bureaucracies move, perhaps it's not long enough. It seems, I guess, to not have been long enough. So in many ways, the area of microremediation has fallen on the independent researcher, uh, the grassroots uh, mycologist and the grassroots mycological uh, groups and communities and, and environmental activist organizations and whatnot to really try to push this forward. The biggest hurdle there being is the cost of testing to be able to figure out what's working and what isn't, which quickly adds up each soil test, looking at different chemicals. Um, it's going to be much more expensive typically than just looking at your nutrient concentration as you might for just growing crops in a healthy soil system. With these types of tests, it gets quite expensive. Ideally, you're doing a lot of them quite consistently throughout the run of an experiment to track you know, how things are going. That unfortunately is, is too much to ask for people that are doing this perhaps already voluntarily. It's really one of the biggest unfortunate setbacks of this otherwise really important field. It's an area that... Um, we all might hope could progress further and you know anybody can really contribute to because it's though beyond the scope of this workshop just to be 
pointed out really not too far beyond just learning how to cultivate mushrooms in general as a you know beneficial hobby we just talked about a, a moment ago this application is just really one or two steps beyond that the same techniques the same concepts really apply in many respects with added caveats for experimental design testing uh, chemical testing and also you know safety protocols and things like that for hazardous materials once those hurdles are overcome especially the the cost of testing um, really the science could could rapidly take off i think good protocols could and will be developed in the not too distant future just unfortunately the decades of research in the lab has barely gotten out into the field uh, with only a few people and a few private companies over all these years really tackling it with varying degrees of success so really this is a big area it's a really big topic it's one that fungi could uh, when we're talking about soil regeneration environmental regeneration environmental health water health human health animal health everything health um, the ability for fungi to break down chemical pollutants in a way that essentially no other organisms on earth can and in a way that's fairly natural is huge but it's still a fairly young science it's certainly a big topic but one i encourage anybody to look into if they have the means and resources if nothing else keep your eyes out ears out and hopefully your means of support open to this uh, really important field of microremediation as it continues to develop with all that said i want to thank you for joining me on this tour through the world of soil fungi and all their direct and indirect influences therein hopefully this has given you some new lines of insight and roads of inquiry now and long into the future as you become hopefully yet another ambassador for the great fungal queendom that serves us as we serve it. Mm -hmm.